Okay. Well, so in 1955, MGM re-released the uh, Wizard of Oz. And as a nine-year-old, I went to the theater expecting to see a Technicolor movie. And it started out in black and white. And I was quite upset, actually, at the time. Uh, so uh, Lewis's, Lewis Kaufman's presentation, you can think of as the black and white portion of what I'm going to discuss here. And we will, you will, as in the Wizard of Oz, you're going to find that the characters uh, from Kansas will show up in Oz. So this is uh, Spencer Brown's statement about um, how the dog ate his, his homework uh, uh, when he was extending the laws of forms to all the different kinds of numbers. And he does not mention set theory, but uh, so I'm not sure exactly how he did that. But what I found is that we can. The click, it clicks, yes. That the laws of sets is actually Im implicit um, in the, the uh, laws of form. And it's. Uh, I use the green cross, uh, and it turns out to be positive uh, from ledgers and so on. But what it indicates is where our focus is, where we put our attention. And this is an illustration from one of his things. And you can see with the green cross, the when you see the find the value of the arrangement, there's a green cross around the whole thing. And this is identified, I think, really with his unwritten cross. And within each step, then you focus on uh, put a green cross around around the. Uh, let me turn on the pointer. You put a green cross around the uh, the two little things here you, that you're going to condense, and that that's where the operation is. And the next operation, you move the green cross around the cross over cross here. And that goes for the cancellation. So the the laws of forms have, have got this idea that you focus your attention on various things to do um, each thing. So that ends up that we actually have an axiom zero um, for the green cross. And it, it is distinction is perfect continence. Uh, you can put green crosses anywhere you want, uh, and it changes nothing. Okay, so if you start with nothing, You've got two nothings, that's a nothing, it's also a nothing nothing. And it's also equal to a nothing and, and a cross over cross. Green cross over green cross is still the same thing. Now, when we get to uh, to arithmetic, and this is where uh, Lewis's stuff comes in, we can think of having a green cross um, with nothing in it as null. One, one uh, black cross as one, two black crosses as two. These are the one elements, okay? And so the green cross becomes, and this introduces sort of the idea of a function. It's the set of function or uh, a count of function because we're going to use the cardinal number of the number of crosses in here as, as our number. Um, we're going to work with the zero elements. They, they come in a little bit later. Okay, so now for sets and in the um, backup slides for this presentation and also uh, on a, uh, a laws of form forum uh, thread, I've got the going through the the uh, axioms for set theory and showing how they they come from the laws of form. But basically, we've got cardinal and ordinal numbers. Everybody realizes that. Cardinal numbers count things. The ordinal numbers give you the order. So you can represent then an unordered set with all the cross, the black crosses at the same level, and you get the successor functions. Uh, if you order the set, laws of forms comes with the unique ordering thing in depth. So that uh, the, if you add in each black cross at a different depth, then you actually have ordered them. And there's some more interesting things that you can do to order crosses. So now, 
this is this turns out to be a, a form that that's going to be very very useful. It's a nesting of green crosses, and each cross is identified as having a particular state. Okay, this is the one state. So if there's a cross, a black cross in here, that means the number is one. If there's a black cross in here, it means the number is two. If there's a black cross in here, it means the number is four, and so on. Now there are two ways to do this. One would be to have them at this level. Um, which sort of is a picture of, of a uh, computer memory. But keeping it this way is going to turn out to be much more effective in uh, applying the laws of form to do multiplication and addition. Okay, so Walter mentioned stable and unstable states. So when you make up, uh, here's adding seven and seven using this method. Okay, the space in here is is uh only allows it, it rejects the presence of two or more uh black crosses so what happens is when you add them together and you force them to be in the space that here these two crosses go away and are push one cross into the next space which is eight and this process repeats uh, until you get to a stable state where there's only one black cross inside each one of the spaces, and that's 14. So, uh, and we know we can use the black crosses to make the logic symbols to make these kinds of adders. So that that ties into that. Now, where do we get the negative numbers? Well, we, uh, assuming that we've got set theory and we've got the idea that you can pair sets. So we have two sets of, of natural numbers, uh, zero through whatever, as far as you can go. And we want to pair them so that the zero element of, of the natural numbers A uh, set is uh, paired with the two of the natural numbers B. And so that's fine. One goes with three, two goes with four, three goes with five. That's great. But what do you do with the the one of natural set of, of numbers B. Well, that's what we pair with minus one. So there's where the negative numbers come and zero gets paired with minus two and you can continue on in the negative direction. So that's that's how uh, by pairing two sets, offsets um, sets of natural numbers, the, the negative numbers appear out of, out of nowhere. So here, here's a little busy slide that shows some of the rules for additive spaces for the negative numbers and the positive numbers. So, okay, so minus, uh, minus one, uh, zero is equal to plus zero. Now, there are some computers that I used in, in my youth where actually minus zero and plus zero were different, but that's another story. Uh, and here are the rules. Now you see, this is really kind of interesting. Uh, when you get to transferring uh, with a green cross, it, it works just the same as before. But here, uh, with if you've got an R on PR under uh, red and QR under green, it ends up with P and Q, and, and so the Rs cancel out. All right. Okay, so this is a we're changing over to talking about dimensions because we're going to try to do things with dimensions now. This is from Bernie's book, and uh, I used it last year, uh, two years ago, and so I'm using it again. Um, the zero dimension is one or the monad. Okay, so thank you, Walter. Um, and so what I've kind of thought of as representing it is. Uh, with one green cross over a number, that's a zero dimension, it's pure value. Put two over it, and it's a one dimensional, and so that means it, that's an indication that you're talking about a length. And then by making this form, you get two dimension area and uh, three dimensions. Okay, so that's dimensions, and what we find is the, the length, uh, we're adding these crosses together. So then we go back to look at the zero and, and the, the one and the zero elements again, and we ask the question, what is the image 
of one elements if the one elements represent extending in length? And the answer, one of the answers is that that means dividing the length. So that's so we change the color of the zero elements of the black over to blue, and we'll use blue to indicate division. So that's one over. Then we can connect division uh, and fractions with rotations. Uh, take a line segment and uh, you rotate it once around uh, and it comes back to the same thing. So that's one over one. You do it two times and you get the halfway point here. Uh, it, there's no figure involved with this because it's all done on the line. But when you get to one third ro rotation, it's like you took an equilateral triangle and rolled it until it was here. And so each one of these uh, sides represents one third of the length of this line here. Same thing for for a fifth of a re revolution. So now, tying this into fig regular figures, and one of the purposes of this is to show all the places where we can start with the laws of form and then go off into all the other disciplines um, that, that are possible. So we've got a point uh, which uh, Lewis said emphasizes the outside. Okay, this really has an inside because there's no real points. Every there nothing. There's the smallest area in the world, so it has no part, no area. It's used for nodes and vertexes. Then we get the line. It has length but no area. It's used for edges and borders. Finally, we get to the triangle, and it's got length and width. It's got area, and it's got inside and outside. So this is this is really the. Probably the first distinction was drawn as a as a triangle. The interesting thing about a triangle is that it cannot be deformed without changing the length of one of the of the sides. Um, so when we go now to parallelograms or squares, we got a figure that has length, width, area, inside and outside, just like the triangle. But it's the first figure that can be deformed without changing the length of the size. It's always convex. So there's another con. We have two, uh, two more concepts that have popped out here. We've got convex and concave. When we get to the Pentagon, we've got five points. Okay. This can be deformed without changing the length of the sides again, just like the, the square. However, it's the first figure that can become concave. You can make it a whole. Okay. Now, if, if if you've done anything with biology, you know that concavity is uh, is an absolute essential for life. Uh, one of the first things the embryo does is is uh, become concave as as the cells divide. Okay, so and it can be conformed into triangles, and that, including this weird one, which just has a little tail on it. And this is a case where you take the these two edges and move them in till they're all straight line like that. So that's another area. So we go off to, into all of geometry. Now let's let's take a look at these um, uh, regular figures in terms of the triangles. And the thing that allows regular figures, any regular figure to become rigid is the fact that it can be divided into triangles. So if you think of a, as a triangle as set of triangles, that's, that's fine, that, that works it, but the square can be turned into uh, four triangles. And there, the rules are, and this is where, again, the concept of odd and even come in. So if there are an even number of vertexes or edges, then the diagonals go from, from corner to corner. But if there's an odd number of vertexes and the, the diagonals going through the center of the figure go to the center of the opposite side. Now, uh, another thing that emerges spontaneously or emanates from this is the idea of rotations and uh, symmetry and orthogonality. So if you take a triangle, this equilateral triangle, I'm going to, I have to mark one of the triangles in order to tell uh, that this has happened. And so if I take and rotate this around the, an axis going through the center, 
by 120 degrees, that marked space moves up here. Everything else looks the same. If I do it again, it moves down here. If I do it again, it's back to the center. So, and if I rotate it, if I do it in two steps, so I do 240, it goes from here to there or from here to there. And again, if you rotate it 360 degrees, it comes back to the same as it was before. Now this can be done, the rotation about the center can be done in two different directions. Okay, so we got the left hand and the right hand uh, rotations. So again, all the dualities that you know we've come to love are beginning to show up. Now, the interesting thing is that, and this is actually something I think that is kind of new, is that there really aren't any reflections. There are only rotations with the axis and the plane of the figure. Um, if, if things are essentially solid, you're not going to have all the things on one side magically appear on the other side. So here are the different ways of that this triangle can be rotated by 180 degrees and reflections and uh, are represented by always 180 degree rotation in uh, the axis and the plane. And this is gonna end up uh, probably giving us the uh, um, half spin uh, situation. So, and uh, in my little figure here, the, the first distinction was drawn uh, as an out of plane rotation. Now, here's the, here's the main tie in to, to Lewis's work. Uh, he, his observation about the additive and multiplicative space were really, really informative to me. So we've got the invariance and variance. Uh, in an additive space, the, the null value is zero. In a multiplicative space, the, null, the unitary value is one. Uh, in an additive space, transposition doesn't make sense for anything except indicates. If if these if P and R and Q and R represents indicators, then this this works because this indicated again uh, is the same as that indication. But if this is a multiplicative space, then we have the process of distribution showing up. Okay, so this shows that it's that we really do have to keep track of what kind of space we're in. So here's the summary, and I stole it mostly from Lewis's um, paper. Uh, so we have the additive space with the green cross, it stays the same. It doesn't change the value. It doesn't change anything. There's the set theory. This is what Lewis discovered, that the additive space is the uh, cross of the multiplicative space. Uh, and now we've added subtractive space, and it goes from additive space. So additive space to subtractive space and back again, and the values are different. Same thing, additive space to a divisive space, which has some of the characteristics of a multiplicative space, uh, and again, the value is different. So we do have a square of opposition then now between spaces, uh, the additive space, and then this is the operation that gets you to the subtractive space, the multiplication space, and this is the operation that goes from additive to multiplicative and so on to, down to divisive. Okay, so what we've discovered now is that we can take the zero elements and we can color them and we get two, the two different kinds of images um, for the real numbers. Uh, and the, the subtractive uh, and the um, divisive. Now, one over zero uh, it, it normally is undefined, but I'm thinking that we really should call it one so that we have the case where uh, uh, a blue cross over nothing is the same as a blue cross over a one. Um, so we've got the additive space being the function set of plus set of the subtractive space being the function minus set of, the divisive space is one over set of, and the multiplicative space was, was hidden in plain sight, uh, and that's uh, multiplying these two together. So, okay, so that handles the, the, um, 
the integers. Uh, what about the irrational numbers? And this is where the reentrance comes in. And I, he, uh, Spencer Brown did not uh, extend the definition, but what we find is in this abbreviated form of E1, where you've got the reentry of with A and B, um, sort of like uh, form and medium, uh, the boundary of a distinction, if the boundary of a distinction is a, of value, a name can be taken out for that value. Thus, the calling of the name can be identified with the value of the boundary. The value of the boundary need not be the value of the inside or the value of the outside. And this is where, this is the Dedekind cut. So we've got here phi, that, that wonderful golden ratio, uh, is represented by the boundary. We say we put all the numbers that are less than phi in here and all the numbers that are greater than phi uh, outside. And this is the value of phi. So we get the golden ratio is defined as phi equals one plus one over phi. Now this, <coughs> excuse me. So if we translate it into the um, Technicolor laws of form, we've got phi equals a green cross one, and this is an additive space, so it's uh, uh, over the division space and put phi in there, and we get the re-entry diagram. Now, phi is also equal to one plus the square root of five over two. And so, and you'll, we'll show you the square root of five in the next thing, but so we've got the case where this expression Actually, or this five sign. Minute, five minute warning. Okay. Sorry. Five. Uh, it, actually, it's like a three minute warning, if, if that's OK. If OK, so okay. all right. So there's the details on, on getting uh, five and some more stuff on. This is important. And this is where the distinction between a demonstration and a proof or a calculation and a demonstration is. So. We've got a calculation. It's a procedure by which, the as a consequence of steps, a form is changed to another. He never said that it's a finite number of steps, and that's where this comes in. So this is a calculation. A demonstration rests on a finite number of steps. So each approximation to this is a demonstration. Okay, so here's uh, where we get the balance in, and this is the formula for square root of n. Uh, and this is its translation into Technicolor. This little uh, form here is a loop breaker, and it detects when uh, you guess the A that actually is the square root of N. Okay, so uh, this goes into reentry as the division. Here's where we get uh, the transition into imaginary numbers. This represents the, so we say that actually, um, one over that's the square root of one. Okay, so and the others imaginary. Now here we're back with BF calculus and uh, getting your I and different ways of doing that. And here I've expanded it. This is the form that represents a complex number, and it's hooked onto there. Now, so the substitution rules. It's interesting. It shows that the reals stay with the reals and the imaginary stay with the imaginaries. Um, here's how to add complex numbers because these things are in like channels. And this is the multiplication. It turns out that the, the, the standard laws of form rule for multiplication works out just fine. And we get a process where a blue over green gets to blue and this blue over blue goes to, to um, red. So you get things working out. Uh, then we get, when, when we look at this thing, we the idea of a matrix pops out of the laws of form and technical. So uh, let me get my cursor back to the right one there. And we can also get symmetric matrices. Now this is interesting because it's symmetric in the, in the result, but it's anti-symmetric in the uh, uh, initial thing. And then finally, we get the uh, outer product. Uh, ChatGPT helped me with this and did the typesetting on that. 
uh, back into BF calculus and into the the matrices representing I and minus I, we end up getting a form that looks like this. So we get the three square roots of unity over here and the three square roots of negation over here. And I made a little figure that you can think of this as a as a the minus template down here. This is the zero level and this is the one. And if you uh, etch out of uh, the one and the and the zero, then you you show the negative, and so on. So that is it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. All right, and yeah, first question from Lou. A couple of comments. Um, there are a lot of ways to do these things. Uh, if you want real numbers, one of the nicest ways to do real numbers is to allow yourself to have a reciprocal, however you're going to do it, uh, and then you can write continued fractions. And then any real number can be written as uh, a continued fraction involving some sequence of integers, like one plus one over two plus one over three plus one over four, any sequence of integers, you get all the real numbers that way. So uh, so I think that's a nice way to extend re-entry forms and get all the real numbers. That's one comment. Another comment is that sets and laws of form can be related very directly in the following way, very close to what you were saying near the beginning. Uh, call a set, and now I'm just going to use the word set, uh, to mean a form which has one mark over all of it, like a mark over a mark over a mark, right? Something like that. And then if you look at any set, then inside of it, there are a number of sets that are adjacent to one another, and those are its members. And then you impose the most general law of calling that you can on it, and you get set theory. Those right. Are two comments. Yeah. Yep. I think that I, if you look in the backup slides, you'll see that I did that. Okay. And the copy of cop of uh, the concept of copying comes out of this, and that gets you the concept of pairing. So um, I think the uh, oh this this is uh, this is the universe, by the way. Uh, the the five uh, levels. Uh, God is a multiplicative state because He said He's one. Okay, so that that pretty much tells you that it's multiplicative. Uh, he made a distinction, and he created the universe as an additive space, and then he made the things in the universe, and that's a multiplicative, additive, multiplicative space. This allows all the things in the universe to act sort of like monads and interact with each other, but that's that's sort of beyond the scope. There are the definitions. Let's see. Where, where do they... Okay, uh, no, that's that's too much. That, that it turns out that uh, Spencer Brown introduced metrics into the laws of form. He just didn't acknowledge it. So, uh, yeah, we have another question here by Walter. Sure. There are many things. I have only one question. If you look for the relationship to Georg Cantor's order types, you have already mentioned ordinality and cardinality from. To me, it could be possible to use your colors with these different kinds of alphabets as when he's using Latin alphabet, Greek alphabet, Hebraic alphabet. Is this something where you have worked on? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, this is, I, I'm pretty much a Plato Cantorian. So uh, the idea was to use color uh, and to not, uh, Lewis uses uh, the labels on the things, subscripts. Uh, to differentiate, but I, it was much more fun to do it in color. Um, you can do, we can do it that way. And there's all kinds of things that'll end up coming out. So, that, you know, that you need 22 letters and things and 10 numbers to do things. But uh, this, that, and one of the things that I really, and here's some rotational, all the, all the stuff that comes out of it. And so, and I'm thinking that Leon could probably turn this into a course 
uh, where you could teach kids uh, everything about mathematics and stories as well um, from this. So, and I, there's the quadrant ion thing, but. And, and we get into physics, uh, it, it, it all connects and that's the whole thing. But the idea is to, to uh, tease out what are the really fundamental concepts, like the fact that, uh, that there is no real reflection. It's, it's a rotation in the plane that um, is, is very, uh, I, to me, that's very important. Uh, to realize that and to get us grounded um, in what the real world is made of, which, you know, it was started with the first distinction. So, and somebody made that first distinction and we call him God and we're not God. Um, so all, all the, uh, and when he made that first distinction, it had an intention and his intention is to have us do laws of form 2024 uh and but and you can't get away from that because what you have to do is if my background shows you know uh, here the miracle occurs so uh that that's it i mean if you're going to do everything with the laws of form it means you have rules nothing is uh anything that's not permitted is not possible it's so it all starts from that first distinction and uh and you just got to live with that so we we are um near a close and there are many um questions still however um i i would like um someone who hasn't um yet asked a question um to go ahead um briefly before our lunch break and then you can respond here and you can state your name yeah thank you my name is adam um i have a quick question do you have explored fixed points using this notation like fixed points, like for example, the square root of two cubed divided by two would still return the square root of two. And if you have explored uh, different theorems in number theory using this notation, just wondering. Well, the thing is that when you connect the laws of form notation with the regular mathematics, like we can do here, um, then you don't have to show that you you don't have to. It's like we said in programming. You can you can push a pea up the side of a mountain with your nose, but why would you want to do that? So once you've once you've gotten away from the cumbersome notation uh, of the laws of form into the the more uh, concise notation of modern mathematics, then then you can just go off and do that. Now I had uh, thought. Where did I do that? 30 the more seconds. Of, yeah. What are the rules? It, it might be really interesting to, to see if we can figure out what the rules are for dealing with these reentrant forms, because we do have this identity here where this form is equal to that form, oh, and this form is equal to that form. And so what are the rules for actually transforming them as reentrant forms? Uh, I, I, and that may be a thing to, to to look into. But once you've made the connection between this notation and that notation, you can go off on the regular uh, arithmetical notation um, just fine. Very cool. So with that, let's thank Lyle again.